Ever since we learned how to talk, we've been talking to ourselves. In fact, that's where most of our conversations take place. The amount of talking we do with other people is nothing compared with all the conversations going on in the mind. You'd think that by now we'd be fairly tired of the whole process. But this part of the mind is always fascinated by what's being churned out. In fact, it's our fascination with all our conversation that can get in the way of our getting the mind to settle down. So you have to work on that. Learn how not to be fascinated by everything you say to yourself. It's not that we totally rule out thinking when we, when we meditate. But we're trying to learn how to sort through things. We're learning how to be a good editor, for one thing. To figure out which of our comments say on the mind or on our breath, or an ability to keep the mind with the breath, are actually helpful. Which ones are not? And this applies to all our activities. The mind has a real habit of learning how to say unhelpful things. And often those are the ones that sting and stay with us the most. So we have to learn how to pull ourselves out of that. As the Buddha said, one of the ways of learning how to gain some control over your thought processes is learning how to ignore thoughts. There are times when you see a thought come up and you can simply direct your thoughts back to the breath, no problem. Other times that doesn't work. You've got to start thinking about the drawbacks of all that discursive thinking. And sometimes that will work. See, the, a lot of that thinking is nothing but old movies, bad ones at that. The type that used to star Jane, star Jane Russell and Ronald Reagan. And sometimes thinking in that way will help get you out of those thoughts. But other times they just keep coming up. The mind is churning them out. Sometimes it's because you're tired. And sometimes it's simply out of force of habit. So you can learn how to pull yourself out. Three analogies come to mind. One is these thoughts are like stray dogs. They come around, and if you feed them, they'll come around more. If you stop feeding them, they'll still come around for a while. When they finally get the message that they're not wanted, and then they go away. And when they come back during that period, when they keep coming back, they'll whine and they'll, they'll scratch and whatever. You have to pay them no attention. If that analogy seems too heartless, well, think about a crazy person. coming to talk to you, and the crazy person wants your attention. But you realize that even if you give the crazy person <clears throat> enough attention just to try to drive the per crazy person away, the person's got you. It's hard to extract yourself, but if you pretend that the person's not there and just go about your business, after all, the person goes away. Again, though, when he sees that you're ignoring him, he'll start saying crazier and crazier things to see what it can do to catch you. You've just got to be really determined. You're not going to fall in with that. You've got the breath here. You've got your work to do. And you have to remind yourself that just because this thinking is going on in the mind doesn't mean that you can't experience the breath. The breath is there. So hold on to that sensation and try to make it as continuous as possible, because it's all too easy when there's a gap, say, between the in-breath and the out-breath, that the mind will slip over to that thinking to check out what the crazy person is saying now. So you say, nope. Keep the breath as smooth and continuous and without any gaps at all. There is a part of the body that regardless of whether the breath is coming in or going out, there is a sensation that's fairly steady there. But that's the steady breath. If you can get in touch with that and realize that is breath energy. It's not just a solid sensation, but it's solid breath energy. 
then you start getting interested in the body again. There's, there's a new level of breath, a new level of energy movement in the body, and it's a different kind of movement. In fact, that's the level of energy that gets you into deeper concentration. That's one way of dealing with these other thoughts. You just get really interested in what's going on in the body and changing your perceptions of what's going on with the breath. But you find it really hard to pull yourself out of all that thinking and that chatter. There are two other ways you can deal with it. One is try to identify whose voice is that. That particular way of scolding yourself, that particular way of commenting on things, that particular way. Who did you pick that up from? And then you can ask yourself, what did that person know? You have to be careful with this, because sometimes you run across somebody and there's a long backstory. But the point is you learn how to not see it as yourself. This is just a habit you picked up from somebody else. The person probably didn't have any ill will toward you. You just simply latched onto that way of thinking, that way of talking, and it became part of your inner conversation. Or you can think about a John Lee's image, that not every thought that comes into your head is your thought. There are all the worms and germs inside your body. Maybe as they go through the bloodstream in your brain, they leave a few thoughts behind. And there are hungry ghosts hanging around, who knows whether other kinds of spirits are hanging around. Maybe sometimes their thoughts get put into your head. So learn how to see these things as not-self. You don't know where they came from. It's just like a random word generator. Like those programs you can find online where they can generate postmodern sentences that are totally ridiculous. They sound like good postmodern stuff, which may be ridiculous to begin with. But then you just put everything into the into the blender and come out with new sentences. A lot of that's going on in the mind as well. In fact, the more you can see the sentences as meaningless and pull yourself out of language altogether. That's a really useful skill. There's a section of the canon, the Atagavaga, that contains a whole series of poems on this series <clears throat> on the topic of clinging, and how to get rid of clinging, or how to go beyond clinging. And one of the features of the poems is that there's a lot of wordplay. And the purpose of that, of course, is to make you stop and think. You know, words are slippery things. We give them meanings, but then the meanings we give them can slip around. You can't totally trust them. And anything that's expressed in words then gets called into question as well. So if you can see this just as nonsense sounds, so much the better. When I was in Thailand, my first year was at Watasokaram, and they had a whole series of monks who had a rotating roster to get up and give the Dharma talks. And out of the fourteen monks who were giving Dharma talks, maybe two could actually give good ones. And the rest were more of a background irritation in the, in the meditation than anything else. And I found one of the ways of dealing with that was to consciously not understand what they were saying. Perhaps it was easier because it was a sec in a second language. I would consciously say, okay, whatever that word was just now, I'm not going to connect it to the next word. I'm not going to connect that to the next word. And I found it a lot easier to keep all that stuff in the background. Then you learn how to use this, apply the same technique to your own thoughts, and you find that it's really useful. 
than just random sounds. Random impulses in the mind. And they don't have to pull you away then. So when the thoughts won't stop, you have to learn how to not get interested in them. Remind yourself that the mind does have this random word generator, random impulse generator. It just keeps churning things out. But just because it's churning the stuff out doesn't mean you have to pay it any attention. And of course, of treating this problem, you begin to realize what the Buddha said, how qualities like feelings and perceptions and fabrication really do depend both on contact and on attention. If you give attention to these things, they're going to grow. If you don't give attention, they don't grow. They may have some momentum from all the past acts of attention that you've given them, and often we've been so good at learning how to conduct these inner conversations, and it's hard to get the momentum to stop. But at the very least, you can pull out of the conversation. It can go on and on and on, but you've got your attention someplace else. And after a while, it'll begin to dissolve. Not only then can you get the mind to settle down more fully, but you've learned a lot about this process of fabrication of the mind. How useful the Buddha's teachings on not self can be. You've learned about fabrication, this tendency we have together with perception. Perception is what gives meanings to things. This is the real instigator. The process of fabrication just churns up stuff. It's the generator of these random sentences. And perception is what gives them meaning. Once you've given it meaning, it, as John Mahabu would say, it creates a bridge into the mind. So when you can cut through the meanings, then you can cut through the bridge. This is one of the ways in which getting the mind into concentration also develops your discernment. The two go hand in hand.